We're back. We're live. Three o'clock rock. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Wow. <laughs> okay, we special show, The Economy and You. Um, and our regular Chris Leatham is not feeling all that well, so I'm going to do it. And we're talking about promoting, mm, promoting dignity through film. Yeah. We're the filmmaker, Jason Scott Jones, a filmmaker and author, too. Yes, sir. Welcome to the show, Jason. Thanks for having me. All right. Great to have you here. So let's define you. You know, that's the first part. Uh -oh. you're, kind of, you're kind of a philosopher and an activist, UH graduate, UH grad. political science. Yeah. And you, you know, you, you, went, you went into the extremes there somewhere in the 90s. Tell us, tell us about your own evolution. Well, I guess for me as a filmmaker, you would say what is the uh, inciting incident of my life or the call to adventure. Um, when I was 16 years old, my high school girlfriend rode her bicycle couple miles to my house woke me up with the news that she was pregnant and my birthday was a few days away and so he conspired that I would drop out of high school and join the army uh -huh. and um, through a special program a friend of mine just entered for delinquents and I knew I qualified <laughs> I entered the army I, I, on my 17th birthday which was two days later I went down to the recruiter's office and a few weeks after that I was off to Fort Benning Georgia and uh, enlisted in the infantry and two weeks before I was to come home, my high school girlfriend called me. It's kind of a sad story. And she called me just wailing, crying like I had never heard a woman cry in my life. And her father found out she was pregnant. She was trying to hide it until I got back from basic training yeah. and forced her to have an abortion. Uh, and that... Wh where did that take place? Here? Uh, south side of Chicago okay. was where I'm from. And here I was at Fort Benning, Georgia. I'd never been to church a day in my life. I was raised in Section 8 housing. I didn't know anything about religion or politics. But this struck me as odd that a young woman in the third trimester could have a forced abortion and, and there was nothing the mother or the father could do about it. Odd, hardly describes it. But yeah, yeah, heartbreaking. Yeah. And then it kind of, a, uh, I was, came to Hawaii, was deployed um, to Thailand uh, my first month here. And on a field problem, I remember coming across, we were in the middle of nowhere, uh, a young uh, father holding his young son who was very, very sick, like on the edge of death. And, I'd asked her translator what was going on. He said that the boy probably had malaria, didn't have much longer to live. And I remember seeing the helplessness in the eyes of that father, which was how I felt just a few weeks earlier at Fort Benning, Georgia. And I would say at that moment was maybe the inciting incident that I realized how privileged I was um, to be an American, to have access to you know, education and resources. And, and it, it was at that moment I think I committed my life I wouldn't have articulated it this way at the time, but as I think back, it's just to live my life in solidarity with the vulnerable or the less privileged. And then I was blessed because after leaving Schofield and going to the University of Hawaii, I discovered this, this professor there who I never had the chance to have, uh, Rummel, Dr. Rummel, who wrote a very influential book called Death by Government. And I remember reading that book and that just woke me up to the sorrow that was the 20th century with this genocide, democide, and total war. And I was able to universalize my experiences and realize what a sorrowful century it was. So then I was there at the University of Hawaii. I said, I want to do everything I can to just use my life to promote the incomparable beauty of the human person. And uh, set out to do that after graduating and just been putting one foot after the other ever since. Whoa. Thank you for defining yourself, Jason. Sorry. Is that <laughs> Blow me away. Now you know Jason. Yeah, sorry. Sorry for such a sorrowful no, no. Uh, oh, answer. No. So what, what is your credo now? You have a, a, a philosophical system you have I do. organized. What is it? I wouldn't say I organized it. I discovered it. You know, discovered I set out it. as an, an, an atheist. And I just, you know, in eighth grade, I read Kurt Vonnegut and Ayn Rand. And they mm -hmm. kind of set my hair on fire. Yeah. And, you know, when I, in the Army, I rediscovered Ayn Rand and started reading everything she wrote. And Kurt Vonnegut's Harrison Bergeron, if you remember that. I read that in junior high. Yeah. And so I was a radical atheist objectivist. And I thought that the problems of the 20th century were caused by collectivism and totalitarianism and socialism. And that the answer to the problem was radical individualism. And so I started writing a book at UH that was eventually became this book. It was called Generation X Manifesto, The Race to Save Our Century. What year was that? This was in 96 when I sat down to write this. And I thought, I'll, I'll finish it. This is why you were studying political well, science. Well, I was an undergrad at the University of Hawaii. Studying political science. Studying political science. Okay. And um, Dr. Kate Cho was a big influence on me as well. And she has, she's a libertarian. I can say she that now. She has comments she has, on your book. She has tenure. Yeah. 
She's been here a couple of times. Yeah, no, she's great. <laughs> and she influenced me, too, and greatly. But it was trying to, to study what were the causes of genocide, democide, and total war in the 20th century. I kind of grew from being a, a radical individualist to seeing maybe more of personalism. I went from being an atheist to a theist to eventually a Catholic. Um, but it was all clawing to try to understand. It was really Sartre and Nietzsche that led me to Catholicism, and, and, and strangely, as strange as that might sound, because they had said that the church was the advocate of this anthropology, this mythological anthropology that human beings were made in the image of God and had this incomparable dignity, which is a lie. And I'm like, well, it's self-evident. And Ayn Rand said that. She said it's self-evident. That answer never satisfied me. I said, that's not an explanation of the source of this dignity. And when Sartre and Nietzsche said, well, it's Christian anthropology is the source of that dignity, I thought, well, it, it must be true because the overwhelming, when you look at a human person, they're, 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 it's obvious that they're the most valuable thing in the cosmos. Well, well why is that? And, and that led me to Catholicism. And then, I, and then eventually the book that was supposed to come out in 1999 and launch my career that I dreamed of having for myself, I realized it was going to take a lot longer. So then in 1999, I said, I want to publish on the 100th anniversary of World War I. That's my goal, or the Armenian Genocide. And that's what I did. I published it on the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. Ah, a scheduled publication. It's 14 years. I have, you know, a lot of times people say, well, I have a book coming out in three years. I'm like, sure you do. <laughs> well, but I, I need 14 years. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and, and we have here a show that we call Promoting... Um, promoting Dignity through film. Through film. Yeah. So again, dignity is, is a central part of your whole your whole cosmos. So yeah. question is, what do you mean by dignity anyway? Well, you know, I think that the inviability of the human person, I'm really kind of obsessed with adult almost with protecting the human person from violence. Violence, Start, that's a big part. Violence is it. Protecting the vulnerable from violence. For me, it was my vulnerable child in the womb and her teen mother. And I was unable to protect my child. I felt helpless. And so I thought, you know, there is the child in the womb is a human person. It's a human being. The Supreme Court denied its personhood, just like the Supreme Court denied the personhood of slaves. And the Supreme Court of Virginia denied the personhood of, of Native Americans. So I looked back and saw, you know, wow, we won't deny their human beings, but we'll deny their personhood. So I thought, you know, protecting the vulnerable from violence. We move the line. You know, we look for different vulnerable communities to destroy. I've been greatly influenced by René Girard as well, the French anthropologist who talks about that, always identifying the most vulnerable members of the community to destroy. Um, so I started knocking on doors in Wahua in 1989, talking to people about abortion on my off days. <laughs> then I eventually did radio with Mayor Fossey and Mark Moses here in the 90s, oh, yeah, well, and well, then well, ran for chairman of the Young Republicans and realized if yeah. I attacked Governor or Chairwoman Lingle at the time publicly, I could make statements in the press. They loved that. And, <laughs> and I kept wanting to reach broader, bigger and bigger and bigger audiences. And, and one day I said, let's just make movies. You know, you have captive millions of people. Uh, when, when, when was that? When did you make that decision? My first film was in 1999. I realized I wanted to make films. At the time, I only dreamed of making documentaries. Hollywood was like this castle in the clouds you could never reach. Before we go to the, uh, the films, I yeah. want to inquire in detail. Uh, the book, yes. The Race to Save Our Century, Five Core Principles to Promote Peace, Freedom, and Culture of Life by Jason Scott Jones and John Zim Zira Zmirak. Zmirak. Yeah. Zmirak. Can you talk to me about this book? Uh, why did you write it? What is it, what is it telling us, and what are the five core principles? Well, I, again, when I was an undergrad at UH, I made a trailer, why you should study and why you should major in uh, political science. And I presented it to the poli-sci department. Well, I was a conservative. They didn't want anything I had to offer. But in making the trailer, it woke me up. I put all the, up to that time, it was the mid-90s. I started with the Armenian Genocide, and I just clipped together all these scenes of war and terror over the 20th century. I ended it with, I went and shot a little video at the, um, the grocery store over there in Manoa by UH, and uh, I ended it with that of a, a lady shopping for like in this huge fruit section. <laughs> and I thought, this, Contrast. Yeah, I was going to say, this isn't normal. Yeah. Our life isn't normal. Yeah. But that kind of, so that's when I thought I have to write the book. Um, but I discovered one principle after the other, and I discovered, I, I discovered Catholic social teaching, you know, I... First, it was this radical individualism, which became more of a Christian personalism. 
And then I discovered the transcendent moral order through the Nuremberg trials. When you study the Nuremberg trials, the West spent the 19th century de denying that there were laws above the polity, above the state, above positive law. And then at Nuremberg, we had to acknowledge once again, well, there actually uh, there is a law that transcends positive law, um, which is controversial today again. Isn't that it's shocking? Yeah. Um, and then looking at the totalitarianism of the 20th century, then I discovered subsidiarity. The idea that what is subsidiarity? subsidiarity is the idea that you keep power as close to the person as possible, and you want to empower intermediary organizations between the person and the state. So you want there to be competition between the family and ethnic associations and fraternal associations and labor unions. And you want power to be decentralized and close to the person. If you look at the great crimes of the 20th century, they all began with eradicating intermediary competitors, intermediary organizations between the person and the state. So subsidiarity to me is very important. If you can have flourishing civil society, the human person is safe. Um, it sounds like um, political uh, science on steroids. Yeah, I don't take any performance enhancing drugs, not even, <laughs> it, uh, not even Ritalin, which I probably should. <laughs> but, yeah. So what are the five principles? Have so uh, the, uh, Christian personalism, or I would I say the incomparable dignity of the human person. Two, there's a transcendent moral, moral order. There's a law above the laws of man. Mm -hmm. Subsidiarity is, you know, you want power as close to the person as possible. Um, three is solidarity, or four is solidarity. The strong have an obligation, while they're strong, because we're not going to be strong forever, uh -huh. while we're strong and while we have privilege to share our strength and our, and our privilege with the most vulnerable members of our community. And five is, is uh, the humane economy, that a just social order is grounded in private property rights set within um, commonwealths. So we own a right to our private property, but we also have to acknowledge we hold that in trust for several commonwealths at a time. A pathway to a better world. It's a manifesto. Huh? It is. It was to explain to my family, really, and friends why I'm so obsessed and, and what the ideas that drive me are. Yeah. That's really why I wrote the you book. You say to race to save our century, it implies not only that you're trying to save the century, within the century, yeah, it's, but that there's a race. What is the race, race all about? Well, it's, it's really sad. When I started writing this book, the editors were throwing out the stuff on the Ukraine and Poland, and you have so much in here. And 600 pages when we submitted it, they said, you're not Henry Kissinger, your mother's not going to read this. Get it to less than 200. And we had a lot on Armenia and the Assyrians and the Chaldeans in Iraq and Syria. This was before ISIS when we submitted it to the publishers. Well, isn't it shocking that 100 years after the Armenian genocide, which is what gave Hitler permission, he said that no one cared about the Armenians, no one will care about the Jews. And, um, Interesting. Yeah. And in, 1914, in 2014, ISIS again, you see the destruction of the Chaldeans, the Assyrians, and the Armenians in, in the Levant. Nobody will care about them. And no one does care, do they? You know who cares? And I'm a Republican, but I, I just, I, I cry when I think about how heroic is, is, uh, is um, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. It's just amazing that this, this Congresswoman you know, from Hawaii has been one of the loudest voices for the most vulnerable mm. people on the planet mm. Earth. You want to see Tulsi part of the, the Trump administration? Um, I would love to see her have the most influence possible in, in shaping foreign policy because she's a veteran. I'm a veteran as a veteran. I want a veteran there. She really seems, that experience seemed to really change her, looking at her from a distance. And it seemed to really focus her. It was her inciting incident, maybe. I think her family raised her <laughs> with uh, a sense of civic duty. Yeah. But, but that, I think her experience in Iraq changed her and really focused her attention on not only the Chaldeans, the Assyrians, the Sunnis, the, you know, Shia and the, and, and the Iraqis, but also our soldiers that we send over there. One last question before we go to the break, Jason. Yes. Uh, this fellow, John Zmirak. Yeah. Is he like you? How much like you Completely is Completely opposite. <laughs> no, my wife, we talk for two hours a day. The way we write is I rant, he takes notes. <laughs> And then he sends it to me, and then we change it. We go back and forth. He's a, he's, I'm a high school dropout from Chicago who's lived in Hawaii for 30 years. I have seven children. He went to Yale, and then, uh, and then he went to um, LSU and then back to Yale for his Ph.D. He's a New Yorker, and my wife is a New Yorker. So when, we, when we're on the phone, she just laughs. She goes, he's such a New Yorker. You guys couldn't be different. He's salty. He's a very salty character. Um, perfect match. Or a perfect match. Well, you're salty, too. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Let's take a, a salty break here for, right. for about one minute. We'll be right back with uh, Jason Scott uh, Jones. Aloha, everybody. 
My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Thank you for watching Think Tech. I'm Grace Chang, the new host for Global Connections. You can find me here live every Thursday at 1 p.m., where we'll be talking to people around the islands or visiting the islands who are connected in various aspects of global affairs. So please tune in and aloha and thanks for watching. Aloha, how you doing? Welcome to Ibachi Talk. Gordo de Texar here. We're here every Friday from 1 o'clock till about 1.45 and we talk tech with many, many great guests. I got uh, Andrew, the security guy who helps me co-host, and I got Poppy Chulo who comes in once in a while to, to help us through the show. So please come join Hibachi Talk every Friday. Angus will be here too. So remember, like we say at the end of every show, how you doing? Bingo. You're not finished with writing books either, are you? No. Jason? You got one in the, in the hopper now? I have four in the hopper. Four in the hopper. Yeah. Oh, God. So much going on. Yeah. So um, the one you spoke about during the break is Socrates and Auschwitz. Yeah. What exactly is the connection? Well, you know, I, I look at the people that really have inspired me, like Hannah Arendt, Leo Strauss, Eric Vogelin, um, Elizabeth Anscom. They were, you know, lived through this just most shocking period in human history, and they looked to reason to address um, the horror that was going on around them, and they spent the rest of their lives thinking about that. And so I think there's a lot that we can learn from these men and women who um, were, were in the middle of this, the greatest genocides and democides in human history. We're, we're trying to use unaided reason to address what were the causes so, of that. So there's, a, there's a, an easy comparison between that and the book of, uh, you know, the book uh, where you studied uh, the Armenian genocide, yeah? Yeah, well, in this book. I mean, this, this book, book looks at a lot book. of genocide. I was drawing on these writers to kind of discover what we yeah. can do, how we can order our lives. But in this case, you're going you're gonna to move much quicker. You're going to do... You're gonna <laughs> Give you're yourself gonna do 10 years. Socrates in, the, in 10 years. Yeah. A lot faster. You're, I guess you're, you're improving your writing uh, technique, eh? I have to, a lot of reading before I can write. Oh, okay, okay. I don't know my material. I have what to you learn read, my material. You read philosophical treatises. Now. I do. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's move to film. Okay, film. Okay, so now you—that's what interests people. You've developed this this um, this worldview, mm -hmm. uh, this philosophy, a very complex, uh, in-depth philosophy, calling on many thinkers and many ideas, and then it, it dawns on you one day that you have to express yourself. The book is one way to express yourself. Yeah. The four other books, that's another four ways yeah. to express yourself. But, but film, you got into film. Why film? Film is it. And how, right? do you, how did you do that? Because we, we know about film here. Why did you do that? Well, I, like I said, I started knocking on doors and then writing press releases, doing radio, and then I did a documentary in 2000, and then I met some young filmmakers in Mexico City by chance, and we did our first movie, Bella. And then we win the Toronto International Film Festival. Oh, whoa. Our first, first movie, movie. First movie. <laughs> And we're just in shock, and we're just celebrated by the world. I mean, we, we had 11 screenings at the White House and wow. at the UN. And So and what, what about Bella? What is Bella? What is it Bella is, is it's such a beautiful film. It's direct, written and directed by Alejandro Monteverdi, whose most recent film, Little Boy, um, was in theaters last year. But it's, it's just a day in the life of a young woman who finds herself pregnant, doesn't want the baby, and she's from a broken home, and she befriends a cook in the restaurant she works, played by Alejandro Monteverdi. Tammy Blanchard, um, Tony Award winning actress Tammy Blanchard plays um, Nina. And it's just a, they spend one day together in New York City. How'd you set this up? This is not easy. You know, it was a young guy out of film school, uh, a, a lawyer, a Colombian lawyer, and a, a Mexican soap opera star. And we didn't have a lot of money. We had less than $3 million to shoot New York. And it just really, everything came together. You gotta do a lot of outreach. You gotta find people who will participate, who will- To invest. Who will invest. That's the hard that. part. Yeah. yeah, that's the hard part. Yeah, and you did. And we you did. found the talent that pulled it off. And we know? did, and, and, and then the marketing of the film was really the, then you find out. I, I, I deal with filmmakers all the time now who they make a movie and they think they're done. No. And you have to tell them, brother, you're in a 12 round fight <laughs> and it's the third round. <laughs> and they're like, what? I'm out of breath. I have no energy. Well, you better, you better reach deep because it's just beginning, yeah. So what, what happened in the, in the one day of Bella's life? Well, I'm going to, a plot spoiler, Nina is going to have an abortion and, and, uh, and Jose whispers something into her ear. He takes her, he doesn't give her any arguments as she's sharing all the reasons she wants to have an abortion. And 
but he whispers something into his ear. It's at the last scene of the film, it all makes sense, sort of M. Night Shyamalan-esque, you figure out what's going on. He whispered, what he whispered into her ear was, I'm going to, please let me adopt your baby. And so the movie ends with him on the beach with his daughter, and that's how the movie ends, with this, looking at this, this Mexican guy looking at this, this little blonde girl running around on the beach, and then that's how it begins and how it ends. And she's coming to see her daughter for the first time six years later. Our goal with the film was to know the name of one baby whose mother chose life after seeing our film within 10 years of our theatrical release. And? We received over a thousand letters. Oh. And on social media, I'm friends with all of them. Oh, no. And I get to see them all grow well, that's up. spectacular. Yeah, and they message me, and oh, we geez. talk. And How long ago would you make the, the movie? The movie came out in theaters in 2007. Our 10th anniversary is coming up, and we're looking at inviting them all who can make it. We'll pay for, for the, um, you know, we'll help with the accommodations, but we want to bring them all to Disneyland. Ah. So where can I find Bella? Bella's on Amazon, net, often on Netflix. A very successful little film. And the next film... Why do film, you say little? That well, it's a $3 so million dollar budget, you know? Oh, okay. It's a sweet film. It's, yeah. The production quality's over the top. Alejandro's yeah. a genius. Yeah. And um, he's a genius. Yeah. Okay, Bella, success. Yeah. Spectacular. Mm. And it sounds like a movie I have to see. I'll be, I'll be watching it tonight. Oh, you yeah. Know, when I your viewership your goes up by email one, you know, I'll be there. I'll be the one. But what, what other movies followed Bella? Well, after Bella, um, I was asked by Steve McAvee, the producer of Braveheart and Passion of the Christ and When We Were Soldiers, to come on and help with The Stoning of Soraya M. And what an experience that was. It was a film in Farsi, the true story of a, a woman who was framed by adultery, framed for having adultery by her husband. It's a real story. It's a true story. was stoned to death. It was a you know, really celebrated book. And a um, very hard movie to watch, but it's a necessary movie. I think I, th I would wish everyone watch it. Watch the message. Once. Um, how fragile and vulnerable, you know, the human person is. Rene Girard uh, says what's different about Christianity and, and myth is Christianity is myth inside out. It puts the ugliness of violence on the outside. It puts the ugliness of the mob on the outside. And it puts those who stand with the vulnerable um, in an elevated position where myth celebrates the mob and it celebrates the violent and violence. And I told Steve, I, when I read this from Rene Girard, I said, you know what, you and Mel Gibson's his business partner, and you, I go, you guys make movies together and separate, but in all your movies, together or separate, they have one thing in common. You leave the film repulsed by violence, whether it's The Passion of the Christ or Heart, um, Hacksaw Ridge, which I think is probably the most moving film I've ever seen. Um, Steve McAvity has a movie that's just coming out called Man Down, starring Shia LaBeouf, that looks at post-traumatic stress disorder in our soldiers. That's a good message to leave people with, repulsed by violence. Yeah. And in fact, uh, Mel Gibson made a movie in Scotland, was it? I can't remember the name. Braveheart. Braveheart, where, yeah. I, I mean, I still think about that movie today, about the, the, the violent end of that movie. I was repulsed by it. It's yeah. the same thing. Yeah. And violence is repulsive. It should be repulsive. Yeah. But it goes back to your thing about dignity, doesn't it? Yeah. You're still, I mean, I shouldn't say still, you're playing out your original rule about, you know, was it uh, uh, promoting dignity, dignity through film? Yeah. yeah. This is it. And we have other things. You know, we do something in Hawaii that I love. Is We do it actually, it's going on around the world now, but my daughter and I started it here. We have backpacks, you'll probably see them all over town, that say, I am made in the image of God. And we fill them with the necessities of life and we give them to the homeless. So you'll see our, our local neighbors without homes. Um, with their bags. Yeah, neighbors without homes. They're our neighbors. Yeah, yeah, and we yeah, have to yeah, remember sure. they're our neighbors. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they just don't have homes. And, and it, but it says, I am made in the image of God. And that's what we just want everyone to know, the inviability and beauty of the human person. So in converting your method of expression from writing um, to film, what did you have to learn about film, about you know, the technical aspects, you know, the different approaches that you have in creating a film as opposed to writing it down? Well. To be honest, I learned that I don't know anything and I'll never know it and I don't have the talent or aptitude. And so initially... <laughs> no, I thought I was got some tips over here. No, the, well, that was not. my first tip, to know what I don't know and hire really talented people and let them be them. Uh -huh. You know, as the producer, my job was to find the money, find the script, and find the right people and let them... Because I was so insecure initially, I just never... Um, Stoning of Sri is where I learned I should express myself a little more because I'm like... We shouldn't call it the stoning of Sriam. Nobody wants to see, you shouldn't tell the ending in the movie, especially if the ending's repulsive. Just we should call it Soraya. 
It's a great title, The Stoning of Sariah. People didn't want to go. We took as polls, and it didn't do as well as we'd hoped. They, and they said the name was why they didn't go see it. You've got to go with your Sariah. gut on these things. Yeah, but, but now I've learned to really love writing and to love the art of filmmaking and storytelling and, and that, that anyone can actually learn it enough as a producer to assist the writers, the director, the creative producers. Isn't that true? So you, you're the conceiver. You're the, yeah. the, the message, the, 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 the fellow who sets up the message and the film is an instrument of all of that. Um, so wh where does it go for you going forward? I mean, are, are, we, are we fixed for a career? You're a young man. Are we fixed for a career now in filmmaking? Is there some other way that you want to extend your message? Uh, what kind of films do you plan to make in the future? Well, we, we're working on a, a documentary right now um, that I can't talk too much about. It's very controversial. It's going to have some of the biggest stars in Hollywood. Ooh. It should be out next year. Um, but we have a short film. I, I, we're, we're, we want to kind of address the Black Lives Matters, and this kind of can put you in a how I think. The Black Lives Matters movement is really started by people who don't feel that they belong, have participation or historical roots in, in, the United, in, in America. And so I said, how do we address that? And with a friend of mine who's a, a black actor and a, and a great stuntman in Hollywood, uh, Buddy Sostan, we, he, we conceived the project and he wrote the script on James Armistead. And James Armistead is the most important spy in U.S. history. He was a slave who was Washington and General Lafayette's most effective spy. And there would be no United States of America if not for the courage and the daring of James Armistead. And so I thought, how do we address this feeling that is, 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 is causing people to not... My ancestors were in Germany, you know, at the time. And, but if you're black and you're an American, you could be pretty confident that a lot of your ancestors were right, you know, in the mainland. And so let's tell the story. Let's tell the story of the important roles that... that um, well, it strikes me that you, you have the flexibility to, to follow these stories anywhere and everywhere. Uh, gee, from uh, Bella to the Stoning to this one, I mean, you have no geographical boundaries. Um, but the one consistent thing is you're protecting human dignity. Yeah. I think that's great, Jason. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us today. Thanks for having it's me. It's been a treat. It's been a whirlwind, a, a veritable <laughs> fire hydrant. Thank you, Jason God bless Scott you. Thank Jones. You.